suggest that we're going to maybe let the panel go a little bit longer. That is going to mean that we're going to have a little less time for open discussion. Um, at about 10 till, I'm going to close with a couple of contact kind of slides and um, what I can do in, in brain dump in seven minutes or less. And then I'm going to volunteer myself and uh, folks who want to or are interested in uh, discussing further to join us out by the posters, grab some food, coffee, whatever, and we'll sit and chat for as long as people uh, have time to do so, and their planes will wait for them. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll, I'll start at this point by just turning it over and saying, uh, let's open it up for questions, comments, whatever. Otherwise, I'll start. Uh, I'm Vic Vikram from NCI. Uh, I have a comment and a question and a suggestion, actually. Uh, the comment is obviously we're hearing two very disparate uh, points of view. We've heard from people saying, I don't mind if the Chinese government gets hold of my data as long as it helps somebody. And on the other hand, we have a situation where U.S. citizens who have Chinese names are not being allowed to, uh, you know, we don't trust them, that, that kind of stuff. So, uh, so I, I don't know how we're going to resolve this tension between ethics committees saying, no, no, you have to protect this data and people saying, use my data so it, it can help somebody. One suggestion I have is this uh, you know, workshop is focused on uh, genomic data, but there's another kind of data that can be very valuable, and that's imaging data. Uh, it's costing us an arm and a leg to de-identify images because obviously somebody's you know, image can be reconstructed, and it's a, it's a real barrier, but the whole emerging field of radiomics can do a lot. And if patient communities would like to share their images I think that would be very helpful. Uh, I mean, the NCI and NIH are moving in the direction of data commons. There's also an imaging data commons. But the de-identification for us is a major financial and logistical burden. But if patients would like to take charge of sharing their images, I think that would be very helpful. I'd, I'd just like to address that. Um, Lung Cancer Alliance, who's now part of the GoTo Foundation for Lung Cancer, actually has a biobank um, where they're collecting imaging. Uh, patients can donate it. Um, now we just need to find a better way to get things from one place to another than having to go pick up a CD at the hospital and mail it. <laughs> I'll just comment that Dr. Brandon Fornwalt at Geisinger is doing a lot of that in relation to cardiovascular disease. So he set up a lot of um, ways to share the images in, in that. So there might be some lessons to be learned from there as to how we structured it. Uh, I just want to make a comment on the first thing you said, which was around, um, uh, you know, bad actors and how do we handle the, the tension between people wanting to share their data and make it useful, but also um, potentially bad players. And I think uh, there was something really interesting that came out of the Sage Bio Networks. Um, John Wilbanks was here yesterday. Um, they had a, a lovely conference a couple of months ago, and one of the things that came out was um, reframing the, the conversation about data privacy and um, information privacy uh, to be about uh, uh, essentially finding ways to punish the, the users of the, of the data that, that do bad things with it, as opposed to trying to um, figure out ways to de-identify data fully, because I think um, we can all agree that computational uh, research and uh, machine learning and um, all those things are really going to probably always be ahead of the curve in terms of being able to re-identify patients or re-identify data. Um, so what if we combated it from the other angle in addition to uh, trying to develop things like differential privacy or using synthetic data for um, answering these questions while keeping the patient's uh, information secure? Um, and to also address the tension about, you know, wanting everybody to have your data versus only select people. Um, yes, those of us who have stage four cancer are probably more motivated to share our data, but we also, closer, sorry, but we also need to think about uh, the impact on our families when we release our genetic data. And we really don't have any good tools for that discussion. Um, I just joined SACCARB this year, which is the Health and Human Services Secretary Advisory Committee for Human Research Protections. We're the ones who put out um, things that the IRBs look at to make decisions. And the whole concept of how you handle data security and the impact of who can see your data is just starting to bubble up as to how, how we handle that with clinical trials. We need more guidelines. 
I'd like to touch just a little bit on what she said. Um, someone has put in my situation where the data needs to be shared as fast as possible for um, future research and cures. Um, it's not the same as somebody who is um, not going through a situation like mine. So it's tough to try to say that um, I shouldn't be able to share my data because these people don't want to, or they should have to share theirs because I want to. We can't put one rule, one regulation and one ruling on all types of people. It needs to be more up to the patient to decide how their data is used and where it can go as moving forward. Hi. Josh Waterfall from the Curie. I wanted to follow up initially with Carly, but I think some of the other panel members might have, have remarks too. So two things in, from your presentation. One, that the Cascadia Commons, I, I'm fascinated by the fact that while it's local, it is also international. And I was wondering if you could say anything more about headaches or, or you know, excite, exciting challenges that that brought about. And also the, the fact, I, I really liked how you're, you seem to be prioritizing sharing the metadata first. And does that at all alleviate concerns about identifiability or, I mean, does it sort of make, the, just making the data, the metadata findable and accessible help help sharing go quicker? Yeah, so for the question about international um, components of Cascadia, uh, what we found is that in some cases it's easier to share data with BC Cancer than with uh, University of Washington, which is right down the street. Uh, the data use agreements and um, uh, data sharing structures are super complicated, and um, what we found is that often the leadership or the people um, that are that are kind of uh, in charge of those organizations have a lot more say uh, than than um, maybe the legality of it. And so I think the, the lawyers tend to always uh, try and err on the side of keeping the organization safe, uh, whereas sometimes the leadership is like, no, well, this is really important and we need to be able to find ways to share data with our uh, collaborators. And so um, what we found is that, um, in fact, BC Cancer, because of a, a leadership change and the people that are in charge there, are actually quite easy to, to work with in this space, um, whereas University of Washington um, we find to be sometimes a little bit more difficult just because of the nature of the organization and how large it is. Um, so uh, the international aspect is, is certainly an interesting component of Cascadia and something that we're really hoping will um, give it some novelty that will help other people learn from what we do. And then um, second, let's see, what was the second question? Yes, prioritizing metadata. I mean, we, we specifically did that to um, try and circumvent the issues associated with these governance agreements, data sharing agreements. Um, being able to get those uh, metadata out as quickly as possible, um, what we're finding is the researchers are happy to share that component. And it is, um, it is, it turns out to be much easier. And then in terms of the privacy, uh, yeah, you can certainly share metadata in a way that um, it's not going to have any potential harmful effects on um, the, the actual patients or has the, um, it doesn't have the likelihood of releasing that information um, the way that an actual data set does. And so uh, we're really optimistic that the metadata approach is going to get us a lot further, at least initially. In relation to the metadata question, I didn't use quite that fancy term, but in a lot of the patient registries that I've helped develop, we have what we call pre-research and research. And what that means is that you make as much of the data that describes a community and their accessibility and things available um, as publicly as possible so that a researcher can come on and see, are there 50 patients with this condition? Are there 50 within a reasonable distance of where I am? Do we have good information on them? And then if they're interested and they see the possibility of doing the research, then they can contact and we can set it up with all the agreements. The other nice thing about that is it makes it accessible to a lot of younger, really energetic researchers who don't know how to go through all the hoops that they can see, oh, yes, there is a project that I can work on. And we found many cases that it actually got new investigators interested in conditions because they saw that there was an accessible and ready patient population to work with. From a, um, a patient perspective, so the Ross Wonders is international. And as long as we're on Facebook, we can rely on Facebook having to comply with GDPR, which is the European uh, General Data Protection Regulation. But as soon as we want to do international research, then we have to worry about whether or not the registry is GDPR compliant and also the fact that many of about half our population English is not their first language and they're required to be consented in their primary language. 
So right now we're actually trying to put together a registry study for um, a, a study came out last year that said ROS1 is much more likely than other lung cancers to have blood clots. And we want to have a larger population than they were able to study. We want to make it international. But we're going to have to set it up in the registry in the U.S. and then have the researchers in the other countries use the exact same questions and go through their regulatory procedures, which are different in every country, and consent people in their own languages, and then we'll have to compile the data afterwards. So it, it does have complications. So I have a question from online from uh, Dr. Fawcett and Dr. Gray. Is uh, reanalysis periodically done for patients with, uh, without positive findings but have variants of unknown significance? And should provider education be made mandatory by policymakers? So uh, I'll answer the question about, about variant reinterpretation over time. Um, in general, most of the major labs have a variant reinterpretation program, and they will um, both reassess variants as well as notify the ordering provider that the variant has changed in status. And some of the changes happen within, um, you know, a couple of weeks to months, and others can take up to decades to be changed and to be reclassified. There's also movement over time from different categories, and sometimes things go up and down in terms of the thoughts on pathogenicity. So um, that is something that happens in the clinical space, I think, with uh, uh, some frequency, although labs do vary in their policies. In terms of variant reinterpretation, though, in a research space, that's a much more complicated issue because variant reinterpretation is expensive and it's time-consuming, and um, studies don't necessarily have the funding to go back and interrogate the data multiple times over the course of the study and even after the study's done. So it's something in terms of research participation that people should think about and know about is whether or not their data are interpreted once or interpreted over time. In regards to variant interpretation, two different levels. I agree with the comment about the research variant interpretation. Though it is a challenge, we're trying to do it, Geising. We're trying to look again every year, second year. Um, again, it's all based on funding. This is funded, at the, that part is funded internally by the healthcare system. It doesn't have outside funding. Um, and then I would say the labs that we choose, we make sure they do variant reinterpretation. And one other aspect of the Genome Connect, if you register there and upload your report, we will monitor your variants, including your variants of unknown significance. And if we see a change in ClinVar, um, we notify you there's a change due to medical restrictions. We try to get you to go to a provider to understand that change, but we give you a red light that there is a change and you need to talk to somebody about it. The other problem that runs into a lot of us change our health care providers um, from time to time, so there may not be that established relationship, so it often makes it hard for the labs to give you an update because they may send it to the do doctor to order the test, but that's no longer your primary care physician, so it creates, it creates a challenge. I'd, I'd also like to add that, um, especially in lung cancer, the genomic driver identifications are chairing, changing very quickly. Since I was diagnosed, um, I was diagnosed when they were only doing individual molecular tests. Now they're doing NGS panels. There's at least a two dozen providers of panels. They don't all test for the same things. And some drivers, like NTRAC, have been found in just the past few years and already have an approved uh, therapy. But if you got your test done three years ago, you wouldn't have been tested for it. And just one last comment. For the clinical testing that we do, where we do report variants of uncertain significance, and we try to contract with the patient that you also have a responsibility to check in every now and then, that there really isn't a way in the healthcare system to put the responsibility entirely on the healthcare provider, that the patient needs to take on a responsibility that, hey, I have something they don't understand. I should maybe check in on it once a year or once every other year. And just the second part of the question, I think, was on provider education. And I think that this is um, an incredibly important issue and one that is really difficult, right? So most of the alterations that we've talked about this morning, as well as many of the drugs, if not most of the drugs that we've talked about this morning, um, didn't even exist when I was in medical school and when many of the um, the majority of providers who are in practice are, are um, when, they, when they did their training, right? And so... Um, 
there are efforts with continuing med medical education, and many of the professional societies have genetics modules to try to help um, educate providers. Um, but because the field is changing so quickly, and because the implications not only to testing changes, but the alterations, you know, are identified, and the implications of the, the alterations change very quickly, I think that we need to think about, again, how do we educate people at the point of care when they need the data, when they're finding that with the most current evidence. And so we really need, and I think the, as a community, to think about new structures for education, both for patients and physicians, so that they can um, make the best use of the data. And just on the education part, that's really been our philosophy as point of care education. Um, and part of it fits well because that's how physicians learn. They learn from doing. They're on seeing a patient with a problem, dealing with that problem, understanding it. Then they hopefully will remember it the next time you see a patient. Um, most of them were not exposed to genetics in their medical training. They didn't see these patients with these diagnoses. So I'm a big proponent of just-in-time education. I think the the pre-education stuff, it's hard to do. Physicians have way too many educational initiatives on their palate. Um, that's really the way we need to go, um, is just-in-time education based on results. And we need to have more molecular tumor boards available so that the community providers know where to go to find this information. And just building on that, one of the, the really innovative things that, um, that we've seen and that the, the um, program that I referenced in my talk does is actually create a social network of providers so that they can ask each other questions that are very, very specific, all de-identified, but so they can learn from each other in the same way that we've been talking about patients and parents learning from each other. Hi. Um, I'm Alex Gout from St. Jude uh, Children's Research Hospital. So just quickly, thanks to everyone. This is a fascinating, fascinating topic and discussion, and I really appreciate being here. Um, just wanted to say that I kind of feel like, you know, if we just take a step back from everything, not worry about sort of the, uh, sort of, I guess, the, all the details, but in a sense, I feel like um, as a biomedician, you know, I remember sort of feeling like we took genetics, genomics into an information science, and into an information age, and sort of having to treat it in that way. And I kind of feel like all of what we're discussing, you know, around data sharing, data access, you know, privacy, all this kind of stuff, you know, access to research um, for treatment, you know, ideas and all that kind of stuff, clinical trials. In a sense, I kind of feel like one day we're going to get to the point where we have like our virtual self which all of this information is stored and all of these decisions and decision-making processes can be made in sort of like a virtual environment, kind of like, you know, we've moved into social media, so Facebook and all this kind of stuff. We're kind of taking our social lives into, uh, you know, the Internet and stuff like that. And I kind of think that one solution would be to have, like, some kind of virtual twin, virtual avatar or something like that where we have all of our information sort of... Uh, located somewhere in information space and that kind of thing. So I just wondered, uh, I guess, from the first three people on the um, panel what they thought about that and then also to Jace, what he would feel about having that as a solution to sort of address these, uh, all of the issues we're discussing. I'll start. Um, I would say there are people that are working down that pathway. Um, we have a lot of efforts with Apple and with Google and with Microsoft to try to create where your health information is there along with the other information. Um, I think one of the difficulties in the U.S. is care is very fragmented. Most people get their care in multiple institutions. Those institutions don't talk very well. They use different EHRs, and they don't, they don't talk across each other. But I would say there are a lot of people working in the space that you want us to be in. I just think it's going to take a while before we get there. From the patient's perspective, um, obviously having a virtual self of your, um, with all of your genomic data and all of your data would be cool to see. Um, but it, it doesn't concern me. Like, I'm not scared of, uh, I wouldn't be concerned by having this data out there and accessible simply because I'm in the position I am. Um, if it, I think it completely comes down to each different patient on how they would decide uh, whether they want this information to be shared, accessible, um, if they can get, up, get to it by themselves. However, I don't think it's going to be the same for each person um, simply because every single person's in different positions. 
Uh, I love the science fiction nature of this question. <laughs> it's really fun. Um, I, uh, I love data, probably like most people here, and I think uh, there's a really bright future for um, using data more effectively, and this is a great um, kind of uh, idea towards being able to use data more effectively for decision making. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, surprise when I talk to people who aren't part of um, the nerd community uh, at how hard it is for us to work together, how fragmented the health um, ecosystem is, the EHRs, the um, data sharing, the data use agreements, governance, um, all of this ends up being very, very difficult. And if we could find ways to do it um, faster and better um, through data, I think um, we could really we could really advance research in a way that um, is hard to imagine right now. So I hope that we get to a point where we have um, these kind of virtual instantiations of pa patients and that we have the ability to use that information effectively for decision making because um, right now it feels like there's a lot of things getting in the way. And I know we're in a transition period, I think. Um, uh, society's in a transition period of kind of getting used to the idea of, of having all this data and figuring out how to use it. I think the, that spectrum of researchers and people on uh, being data savvy is going to keep pushing towards the more data savvy. And as we get closer to that end, I think things like what you're talking about could uh, make a huge difference in the way that we um, uh, treat patients. I thought I might just share with you quickly. Uh, Jason, I spent the last week visiting with members of Congress and probably more often than not, their health policy staffers. And some of the discussions we were having were exactly on an issue like that. What is the best way to create that information sharing that's patient-centered? Um, and we believe it's incentivizing and monetizing sharing of research through those grants instead of always protecting that research, number one. And that resonated very well uh, with those that we visited with. But secondly, we talked about how um, in many ways this is not that different than where the financial markets were a decade, two decades ago, where we had to decide how open we wanted to be with our financial information in order to transact business internationally, online, with Venmo. And I serve on bank boards, and let me tell you, there is no one more rigid in the protection than a bank board. There is no one that likes to hear Venmo and Bitcoin less than a bank board because of the fear and risk. But you know what? The millennial generation, myself, others, have Venmo. We're using it. So the market's going to drive this path. Um, what we talked about was the need to make sure those in the rare disease uh, category that won't uh, have the numbers for a market to drive their cures to not be left out, to make sure that we as a nation um, continue to put dollars towards making sure that information gets shared. But I would just challenge you to look at it in that way. Sometimes we can become so academic that we forget there are consumers and those are patients on the other end. And they will find ways to use data that's available that may not be as safe or effective as you that have devoted your lives to this work would be able to do. And to take what you've said and address your question in terms of having a virtual entity that would gather everything related to my disease, we're trying to do that in the Facebook group. And I recently did a search. Um, if I did a search two years ago for Ross One articles, there really wouldn't be that many. My last search, they pulled up 20. And I looked at a lot of them, and there were researchers I didn't know. And I, I know enough about science to look at it and say, this doesn't look like a well-designed study. So I contacted one of the researchers that works with me, and I said, how do you know how to vet which of these articles are really worthwhile to pull into my database? And they said, um experience, <laughs> which, so one of the things we have to think about in data is we're going to have to create tools to help patients vet which of this information is worth keeping and worth looking at. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Reed Bender. I'm a student at Clemson. I have a question for Dr. Freeman Daly specifically. Uh, you mentioned in the cancer in the moonshot project how y'all are taking a lot of the tissue samples and turning them into cell lines and processing them and uh, 
making them last that way. And I was wondering, um, with those cell lines, how many of the tissues are actually being converted to cell lines, and are those cell lines available for researchers to obtain and process and grow on their own? So just to clarify, the Cancer Moonshot Biobank is still in process. It doesn't exist yet. Um, the rare cancer effort that the Broad and Pattern.org are working on does exist, and they have made all their cell lines available through ATCC so people can access them. The things that we've made through the Ross one um, cancer model project, uh, we don't have any PDX mouse models yet. The cell lines that we have are available by contacting the researcher, Dr. Robert Doble at University of Colorado. Um, and if pharma wants them, there's a, they've another process to go through through the university, but they are all freely available. Thank you. So I have a comment from online and, and a question from online. Uh, the comment first, because it relates to the previous discussion, is that the University of Leiden is using digital twins uh, uh, at the genomic level to, to support research. And now the question I had was whether uh, someone in the panel could talk more about Jace's idea about having a card or identification number linked to authorization of access to genomic data and, and how this could be used to track and are there models uh, for this that may work. And I know we talked a little bit uh, yesterday or a bunch yesterday about blockchain and other models. And I guess I was wondering if the panel had any experience or thoughts about this. Feels dangerous to wade into this territory. Um, so, you know, I think the idea that someone could, for instance, encrypt their data and then make it available to selected people by, say, sharing a decryption key is sort of a, definitely like an attractive model um, that gives someone control over their data in a way that, you know, it exists, it's public, but then when that decryption key uh, or encryption key gets destroyed, it sort of becomes useless. Um, this does sort of depend on our ability to factor large numbers going unchanged in the sort of immediate future, and it, it, you know, that's definitely, there's a risk there associated with sort of trusting current encryption with the future. Um, so essentially it's a question of just how long you would, you would really want that to exist uh, in a um, private way and how much you trust that current technology will allow that privacy to continue. Um, and then on the blockchain side, I mean, I think blockchain, again, is sort of an attractive technology to have a distributed database, but you know, if there's no specific reason your database needs to be distributed, then it's an enormously complex way to build a distributed database and so, or to build a database. So I guess um, I don't quite exactly understand what the sort of use case the question was precisely getting at, but those are sort of my thoughts on the technologies that got mentioned. It'd be interesting to think about could you build a system that the user can opt in and opt out as they choose. So I might not today want to share my information outside of two or three institutions that I want to work with, but at some point I might want to make that more available to some independent researchers that aren't connected with a clinician that I'm using at an institution. And could I also, as I opt in and opt out, uh, design a proxy who would continue to be able to give uh, password, give information after my death. Um, because for so many bereaved parents, they want to be able to continue to allow their child's uh, or even adult's child information to be used for the good, um, even if it's not for their, their own loved one. So uh, we like the idea. I, I'm not a programmer, but I will tell you that there is a, a group of us that are going to be discussing situations like that tomorrow in New York with people that are not medical uh, information providers, but they're data analysts at top companies. And um, they're going to take that consumer piece and say, gosh, we're doing it in all these other ways. What transitions and what doesn't transition to genomic information? Just for folks who happen to be online that weren't here yesterday, there's session two address some of these concerns directly. Hi, my name is uh, Manuel Copas. I'm chief scientist of Cambridge Precision Medicine. And I, I would have loads of questions. Um, I probably have to choose one or two. But um, 
There are a couple of things that I keep hearing today. Uh, one of them is the need for education uh, on this uh, field. But can you be a bit more specific about the type of education? Uh, because I, you know, for those of us who are involved in that, uh, I would like to know how we can meet that demand. What are the specific contents that you are looking for, the specific channels that you are looking for? And then the second question I have is, obviously, some of you have your genome uh, characterized. Some of you have some results. But how about the fact that those results can change with time. The fact that uh, as time, as we learn more about how, um, you know, the, the genetic markers have been annotated, functionally annotated. So how about the issue of reinterpretation and the fact that things might change? Uh, for those of you that have already results, um, do you, is, is that it? Are you going to want to have your genome reanalyzed in a few years' time or in a couple of years' time, knowing that things could change, knowing that new markers, new findings might be. So what's your take on that? I, I can tackle some of that. Um, I had my um, ROS1 fusion identified by a single molecular test, so I have not yet had my genome sequenced. When I had that happen, they Foundation One had their test out to do a 300 gene panel, and I asked my doctor and said, so if I happen to progress, um, will we run that test? And he goes, well, we'll see when it happens, because nobody was doing it. Um, now there are so many options out there. Um, I think it's, so you're asking about education. There's so much that people don't know about this, and there's so much that most the general population of doctors don't know what the experts at academic medical centers know. Um, yes, you can run a foundation medicine panel genome if I happen to progress, but it's not going to pick up my resistance mutation because it's not doing deep sequencing. There are other genomic panels that would be a better choice. So one is people need to know that there are different tests that are, have different purposes, and some of them actually right now don't test for ROS1 and some do. So one, the choice of test matters now. And in the future when I progress, it might choose a different test based on what the need is. Um, we need to educate doctors about this. As, as was being explained, most doctors don't even test for ROS1. And we have a targeted therapy that's got a better response rate than just about anything seen in cancer, and people aren't getting the drug because no one's testing them. So there's education needed for providers. How do we help them keep up with lung cancer genome that's changing so fast? Um, we need concentrated places for information. We try and put all of the data about current ROS1 drugs um, available on our website, and I've had doctors at academic cancer centers come up and say they've used that as a reference to give other doctors because it's the only place where it's all put together. We're, we're going to need to find new ways to keep people educated about these options. So at least you asked about education, and there's a few of them. So I think, Sean, one of our outcomes for this meeting is to come up with some kind of genetic literacy um, syllabus. To kind of build on her um, her point of education, the the problem that um, patients in situations like mine with rare diseases run into is um, the gap between my oncologist and a researcher. the The gap of knowledge there is so vast that um, we we're stuck using I mean other parents to kind of um, help us reach that gap and kind of help us figure that out. So. Um, just a thought of mine would be, what would it look like if we had um, somebody that either worked for the hospital or worked for these foundations that it was their job to help them help uh, understand what their genomic data means to them, what kind of uh, clinical trials are out there, and kind of uh, bridge that gap and explain what this information means because um, that way these 
patients are able to make an educated decision instead of uh, just kind of looking around on the internet until they find something that looks good. Uh, so it's interesting to think about this gap um, that you're talking about, and it's um, something that I've seen a lot uh, in thinking about uh, data science among researchers and how to how to get them to um, understand how to apply new techniques and tools for analyzing large data sets. Um, I think the what training needs, I love this idea of just-in-time training uh, for clinicians or for people that are kind of on the front lines. Um, and I, it strikes me that it's it's very similar to the way that researchers often work, which is that they um, look for uh, they look for solutions and they find something that might work in the literature or, uh, from a colleague, and then they they go learn about it. And we have that luxury of time as researchers um, that I think patients don't have, um, as we spoke about a lot yesterday. And so thinking about um, bridging that gap, I love the idea of having um, individuals that are responsible for kind of helping helping individual patients um, connect with the research community, help the clinicians connect with the research community and really think through um, how we can get some of these new novel ways of approaching questions into the hands of people that are at the front lines. And this is a biased comment, but in answer to your request, Jace, I would say that's what genetic counselors do in many cancer centers. They're there to help you understand your genetic findings and help you find ways that that information can be used. Um, so that's something that I think, like you said yesterday, more in the right places is important. Um, and then just a comment about sequencing. I, I often say for germline, sequence once, reinterpret often. For somatic, you need to resequence. So I think anytime you return a germline genomic result to someone, you need to share with them that this needs to be looked at again in the future. And again, it's that contract between the provider and the patient, um, how that happens. Now, we got a lot of questions, who's going to pay for it, how do you do it, those kinds of things. But I think at least setting the contract that your germline needs to be re-looked at on some interval. And I think where that's also important is we're finding more and more that you might have a primary pathogenic variant that's leading to disease, but there are probably lots of other variants that may be impacting that. And that's an area we're just starting to learn, so what we know tomorrow will be very different from what we know today. So, again, germline, sequence once, look at it often. Yeah, your points are very well taken. In Jace's case, um, his tumor is in his pons, and so that biopsy is very, very difficult. In fact, uh, the neurosurgeon who did his biopsy has done, as I understand, more than anyone in the world, and Jace was number 61. So going in to do multiple biopsies is uh, not necessarily something anyone wants to do. But it, from a patient's perspective, I just want to drive home that when we were making that decision, and we had a little bit of a gap because of imaging um, an MD Anderson not wanting to biopsy not feeling comfortable doing a biopsy, um, but most don't. But in that period of time, you have to decide, am I at a place that's going to share my information? And I'll be honest with you, if it weren't for mothers who had traversed this course before, I wouldn't have even known to ask that question. Um, that's another reason why that information sharing is so important. Um, Jace could easily have had his siloed right in that uh, facility, and it wouldn't have gotten to where we needed to go. To your point, I think the genetic counselors is a piece, but I also feel um, perhaps at that information data sharing point where we're matching genomic data with clinical trials, maybe it would be helpful to have a navigator attached to that as well. Um, in Jace's case, we've been fortunate to have good providers, but uh, we're at uh, St. Louis now, very pleased. Um, but they would, they would easily tell you, it would be so helpful to me if there was a navigator that can navigate with these specific mutations these are the best clinical trials, and this is why I would be looking at these things, instead of just accessing a database and having to kind of sort through it themselves. Yeah, I want to build on the importance of yeah. that. Um, if I were to go into the clinicaltrials.gov database and put in lung cancer, I would pull up 1,200 clinical trials. If I put in ROS1, I might pull up three. But if you just put in, um, you know, it's a person who doesn't have a genomic driver necessarily, there are hundreds of clinical trials. 
And, yes, you can narrow it down by how far you're willing to travel, et cetera, but that still doesn't tell you which one is giving you the best chance of having effective treatment. There are a lot of clinical trial finder programs out there, but most of them do not have a clinician attached to them who actually understands your particular cancer to give you that kind of information. What we ended up having to do for ROS1 is create a page of ROS1 experts of these are places you can go get second opinions to help you figure that out. But we don't have that for most cancers. And I, so to talk to my Fred Hutch college down there, one thing that I've I think would be wonderful would be to have regional centers whose job is to help people locate effective clinical trials. One of the ways many of the rare diseases have done that is through the rare disease organization. So they have a person there who tries to stay on top just because it is it is something you need to look nationally, internationally, and other things. So that that's one model that's worked well for some of the rare diseases is to centralize that in the patient advocacy group, um, hire a professional who can do that, who has the knowledge, either Jack Counts or some other healthcare provider to play that role. Some have been very successful with that. I think, you know, we could go on for literally days, um, but I really want to thank the, the, the panel, and um, I want to give myself a few extra minutes to, to wrap things up. Like I said, uh, we're going to be uh, meeting out uh, next to the, uh, the posters for people who want to have follow-up questions or discussion, um, that kind of thing. Um, at this point, I'm going to switch over, switch modes a little bit, um, back to uh, the sort of program and go to thank you slides and things like that.